Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for another exciting edition of Science Division Live. My name is Talia. I'm the Virtual Experiences Coordinator at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and I am connected today to Dr. Paula Cushing, who is our Curator of Invertebrate Zoology. And she's usually here to talk to us about spiders and arthropods, and she's still here to do that today, but she's going to be taking us on a slightly different journey into the world of entomology. And specifically today, we're going to be talking about entomophagy or the eating of insects. So maybe you've eaten insects before, maybe you haven't. We would love for you to tell us in the comments if you have or if you have not. Um, and don't worry if you're a little bit freaked out by the subject, because I have to say I am a little bit too, but I'm hoping that today Dr. Cushing can convince me to maybe run out to my local grocery store and buy some <laughs> flour or something like that. So she's going to be telling us today all about what are the reasons why our society, as one that doesn't eat insects very often, is in the minority. How does our culture influence our perception of what is good to eat? And she might even give us a few convincing reasons why we should all be chowing down on some bugs. We want to thank you all for joining us today, watching along on Facebook. I will be watching the stream this entire session on my handy dandy device. So if you have any questions or comments, anything you'd like to share at any time, please do pop those in the comments whenever they come to you. We will be watching and we'll get a chance to ask those questions to Dr. Cushing live and on the air as soon as her presentation is done. All right, I'm going to turn it over. Uh, how are you doing, Paula? Any uh, ah. insects on the menu today? Well, you know, none, none on the menu, although I have my mealworm culture here at home, so I can always sort of grab a handful and throw them in the pot if I want to. So, uh, you know, with quarantine, you never know when you're going to run, run short of some, some protein. So I'm, I'm good. I'm set. I'm all set. So thanks, Talia, very much. I'm happy to be here today. And I am going to share my screen and um, just plunge into my presentation. So what I am going to be talking about, as Talia said, is eating insects. And the technical term for eating insects is entomophagy. If I can get my slides to move. Entomophagy is a term that comes from two roots, entomo meaning insect, and phagy meaning to eat. So I am going to be talking exactly what Talia suggested about eating insects, including insects in human cuisine. Uh, and before I plunge into this topic, let's just talk a little bit about what insects are and what some of these, these uh, what we would consider weird things to eat, where they, where, how they're classified. So insects are in the kingdom Animalia, they're in the phylum Arthropoda, and arthropods include anything that has an exoskeleton, and jointed legs. And within that big group, that phylum arthropoda, there's lots of different subphyla. And the three subphyla that I've listed, the subphylum crustacea, subphylum hexapoda, and subphylum chelicerata, are all arthropods that worldwide human cultures do eat. And we know about crustacea. Subphylum crustacea includes our crabs, lobsters, shrimp, now I think even in Western cultures, United States, Canada, Northern Europe, we are used to including insects and shrimp, or, or sorry, crabs and shrimp and lobsters in our diet. We don't even think twice about that. But worldwide, they also eat other groups of related arthropods, animals that are in the very same phylum, including the subphylum hexapoda, which includes the class insecta. So lots of places in the world, lots of cultures eat many, many, many different kinds of insects. And there are many cultures that also eat animals in the subphylum chelicerata, the arachnids. So there are cultures that regularly eat roasted scorpions, roasted tarantulas, other kinds of spiders. So what I mentioned was that in the United States, Canada, Northern Europe, many of our cultures, our Western European derived cultures, we consider, a lot of people consider eating insects to be abhorrent, bizarre, strange, just something they would never consider. And yet we are in the minority. 80% of cultures around the world regularly include insects and other kinds of arthropods in their diet, not just crustacea, but arachnids and lots of different kinds of insects. For example, in Mexico and central other Central and South American countries, you can readily get escamole on the streets. And escamole, you'll, this is a picture I took in Mexico, escamole are roasted uh, grasshoppers. 
And you can just go up to one of these street vendors and get a baggie full of these delicious roasted grasshoppers to snack on as you're touring the town. Also in Mexico, in any, just about any restaurant, if you want, you can get escamoles on your, uh, uh, not escamoles, chapelines. These are called chapelines, the roasted grasshoppers. You could get chapelines, the roasted grasshoppers on your tacos if you want. Escamoles, the word that I was using before, that is um, a cooked ant pupae. And this is a picture I took in a very nice restaurant in Mexico of a, a meal, a kind of a dish. It looks like a rice dish, but those round objects are escamoles, they're ant pupae. So that's very, those are all very commonly eaten throughout Central and South America. In, in parts of Africa and other parts of the world, they will eat termites. So termites build these massive mounds and periodically the termites will go through a reproductive stage. Termites are social insects. And during these reproductive stages, the termite mound will produce tens of thousands of winged reproductive termites that leave that mound en masse. And in some areas of the world, the cultures that live around these, these abundant termite mounds will take advantage of this readily abundant food source and will go out and collect basketfuls of these winged termites to include in their diet. And the queen termite in many cultures is considered a delicacy. So this is a picture of a queen termite. Here's her head. This big sausage shaped thing, that's her abdomen. She is just an egg laying machine. So she is being tended by worker termites that are surrounding her. These are all her worker termite uh, that are tending her. But in some cultures, that queen termite with the huge sausage shaped abdomen is considered a delicacy. She is just loaded with nutrients. In some places in Australia, uh, the Aboriginal cultures readily include insects, different kinds of arthropods in their diet. For example, witchetty grubs are a type of moth larvae very large grubs, very large larvae, and they are frequently eaten by the aboriginal cultures. They're a great source of protein, great source of nutrients. They also in Australia will eat honeypot ants and honeypot ants build these underground nests and in the ceilings of the nests hang what we call replete workers. And these replete workers are hanging from the ceilings. They have these huge distended abdomens and their abdomens are filled with a sugary sweet substance, a nectar-like substance. And the replete workers are there to feed the other sister workers in the colony. So the other workers in the colony will come up, will antenate, will tickle the abdomen of the replete worker. And the replete worker will poop out, out of its anus, a droplet of this very heavy sugary sweet substance to feed to her sister workers. The aboriginal cultures will break into these mounds, will scrape the repletes off of the ceilings of the chambers, and will just pop those abdomens into their mouths like a little bit of afternoon candy. And even here in the United States, um, the Native American cultures would oftentimes include insects in the diet. So this is a view of the Great Salt Lake. And if you've been paying attention to the the news, sort of the non really dismal news, there is um, currently India is, is experiencing a locust infestation. So locusts worldwide will periodically swarm and locusts are a kind of grasshopper. And in the past, we would see a lot of these locust swarms even here in the United States. And in the past, when a locust swarm would fly over the Great Salt Lake, a lot of those grasshoppers would get stuck in that salty water, would get naturally salted, and the Native American communities living around the Great Salt Lake would take advantage of that protein source, would go out, would collect those, those naturally salted insects and include them in, in their diet. There are a lot of resources out there if you're interested in entomophagy, interested in how cultures have used food, insects in the diet over the millennia. This is just a small smattering of books that I have in my personal library, but there's some great resources like man-eating bugs and butterflies in my stomach. They talk about how over the millennia, humans have included insects, 
arachnids, these other kinds of beasties in their diets, these other kinds of arthropods, and there are even cookbooks out there. So these are just three of the cookbooks that I have. So if you're really interested in it, there are recipes available. So you can go to your local PetSmart and get some crickets or mealworms and get a, get a nice recipe to cook them up for dinner tonight if you would so desire. There's also a lot of online resources. So this is just one of them. This is the Food Insects Newsletter, which has a lot of information. It's a really rich source of information about how humans have incorporated and used insects in their diet over, over our entire human species history. So as you travel around the world, it is very common, except in United States, Canada, Northern Europe, it is very common in all the other cultures of the world to see in the, in the local markets, the outdoor markets, to see all of these kinds of arthropods that they have for sale. So you'll see baskets. These are, are probably either grasshoppers or aquatic insects of some sort. These kids have gone out and collected, I think they're, they're holding uh, dragonflies. This little girl is eating a roasted tarantula. And these are very common sites to see. You can even see businesses that, that sell tins, that sell cans of insects that are, that are for sale for human consumption. This is a whole platter of scorpions. These are all scorpion tails. You can find scorpion kebabs in some parts of Asia, roasted tarantulas. These are some kind of aquatic beetle that's for sale in these open air markets, silkwood, pupae, it's endless, the number of kinds of insects that are available for human consumption. Now, in this country, let's talk a little bit about the basis for our biases, because that's what I, I think they are. They are biases against certain kinds of foods, because it's not that insects are inedible. They're perfectly edible. They are a perfectly good resource for nutritional and, and high in nutritional value, but in it, but the reasons why we don't necessarily include insects have more to do with cultural bias, I, I would argue. So let's talk a little bit about honeybees, because I think this sort of brings this message of cultural bias home in a very, in a very concrete way. So honeybees, we, we have honeybees all over the United States. We use honeybees and other native bees as pollinators because what do the honeybees do? They go out to our agricultural fields, they go out to flowers. The flowers are attracting the bees by offering them a nectar award. The nectar is a sweet sugary substance, but the bee in the process of getting this reward, this nectar reward, is in the process pollinating the plants. So they are very effective pollinators. But what do the bees do with that nectar resource? Well, they store it in their honey stomach. They bring that resource back to the nest. They regurgitate the, the nectary, sugary substance from their honey stomach to other worker bees who continue to regurgitate it until finally they store that concentrated sugary sweet substance in the cells of their honeycomb. And then they, they wave their wings around to evaporate the moisture and really thicken that material until it becomes what we know of as honey. But in some parts of the world, they readily eat the bees. They eat the bees in the form of fried bee pupae, like this dish in Vietnam, or probably in some areas, they'll eat the adult bees. In our country, in the United States, we would consider a lot of people, not me, of course, but a lot of people might consider that abhorrent to eat the bees themselves. But we don't think twice about eating honey. Yet what did I just tell you honey was? All honey is, is bee barf. But people don't think twice about eating bee barf. But they think it's just disgusting to eat the bees themselves. That, to me, is a little wacko. And one of the things I love to do when I travel, and I've traveled all around the world, and one of my favorite things to do is to go to local markets, go to supermarkets, open air markets, wherever. I love to see what kinds of proteins that culture has for sale, what kinds of, of vegetables they have for sale, what kinds of fruits they have for sale, because many times, usually, 
I am seeing things that I would never see in our local markets here in the United States. So this is a view of a fish market in Italy. And look at the diversity of seafoods that are available in a country that is surrounded by the ocean. You see seafoods and fishes and different kinds of aquatic organisms for sale for human consumption, unlike anything you would ever see in our markets. You see a huge diversity of different kinds of cheeses, cheeses whose names I've never heard of, a huge diversity of pastas, and these are all from Italy. And in other parts of Europe and other parts of the world, you'll see an incredible diversity of vegetables. This is just a, from some market in Europe of, of the diversity of lettuces that they have for sale. This is looking down in a street market in Mexico to see the diversity of different kinds of corn they have for sale, different kinds of legumes, different kinds of nuts they have for sale. I just love to see that diversity and to realize how much more uh, organisms are out there, be they plant or animals that are perfectly edible and that human cultures do eat that we don't necessarily see within our culture. And that goes for any culture worldwide. They're gonna come to our country and see things that they don't necessarily see in Europe or in South or Central America. So where do these food biases come from? I would argue that a lot of our food preferences, food biases, what we consider good to eat, bad to eat, acceptable, unacceptable, comes from what we grew up with. So this is a picture of my dad with, with his parents when he was a young man. So it comes from our family teaching us what's good to eat, what's not good to eat. It comes from our friends, our peer groups, who tell us and influence our own food preferences. And oftentimes it comes from our religious beliefs. So for example, in the Muslim and the Jewish cultures, it's considered taboo to eat pork. In the Hindu culture, it's considered taboo to eat beef. So I would say that our food preferences are coming largely not from what is available to eat, what is okay to eat, what is edible, but it comes from this combination of cultural influences, family influences, religious influences. So hopefully after, uh, and, I, and I think I would add too that as we're traveling more, as humans become more and more interconnected, what we're beginning to see is a, a more of an acceptance of what other cultures are doing, what other cultures are eating, uh, because we're being exposed to those other cultures as we're traveling, as we're seeing those other cultures. And we're even beginning to see this shift in what is acceptable locally. So this is a, a local restaurant here in Denver called Linger, and Linger regularly offers on their menu cricket tacos. And why should we consider insects as part of the human diet? Because it's healthy. So this top graph, what you need to get out of that top graph is showing the, that per 100 grams, crickets in blue and per 100 grams of beef in yellow, crickets are higher in protein, lower in saturated fats than the equivalent amount of beef. The bottom graph is showing essential amino acids. Blue is crickets, yellow is beef. What you should get from that graph is that insects in the diet provide all of our essential amino acids and provide them at very high healthy levels. It also takes a lot less land to grow insects for human consumption. So it takes 200 square meters of arable land to raise just a kilogram of beef. It takes 50 square meters of arable land to raise a kilogram of pork. It takes 45 square meters of arable land to raise a kilogram of poultry. It only takes 15 square meters to raise a kilogram, the equal equivalency of insects for human consumption. And insects are better at converting usable nutrition. So if you're eating an insect, 80% of that body is directly converted into usable nutritional value versus only 40% of the body of a cow is converted into directly into nutritional value. We're even beginning to see businesses that are offering insects for sale for human consumption. And here in the Rocky Mountains, we have the Rocky Mountain Micro Ranch, which is run by Wendy Lou McGill and her micro ranch where she is raising insects for sale to area restaurants is a shipping container. That's all. 
This is looking inside her micro ranch. And in those containers, she is raising mealworms and crickets for sale to area restaurants. And those area restaurants, these are just three of the area restaurants that are beginning to consider insects as a regular part of their menu. Linger, Comida, El Jefe, even our own DMNS um, head chef, Patrick, uh, Patrick is considering including insects as an, a regular offering in our, in our cafeteria. There are online resources for buying uh, cricket flour. So this is a, one company called Chirps that will offer for sale cricket flour and cricket chips and chocolate chippy cookies that are made from cricket flour. And this is just one probably many companies that are that are popping up, hopping up, maybe hopping up would be a better term, and offering these kinds of insect resources. So I hope that I've at least opened your mind to the possibility that insects are a very good resource, good source of nutritional value, something that you should consider. It's a fun new food for our menus. So with that, I think I'll say bon appetit, and I will end the presentation and see if we've got any questions. All right. Um, I have to I have to say it, y'all. Before we got started on this presentation today, Dr. Cushing and I were literally talking about, so I have a background in biology. As a result of that, I have dissected many, many, many organisms, um, including things that are considered delicacies um, that to me, because I know what they look like on the inside, I just, I can't do it. I do eat meat, but there are certain things that I can't eat because I know what they look like on the inside. And that for so long, has included insects and arthropods, even things like lobster I've had a hard time with before, but that was such a good argument that I you might have me convinced. I might good. have to suck it up. I might have to put my fears and my weirdness behind me and give that a try. Cause yeah, that was a pretty tremendous argument. And I do see some comments saying the same. So before Great. we jump into questions, cause we do have a few, I do just wanna share out some comments from our watchers today. We did ask you at the start of the presentation if you have eaten any insects before, and we did get a couple of comments from folks who saying that they have. Danani says, I've had a variety of insects. Uh, Laura says that before the state safer at home orders began, uh, one of her family's most wonderful meal experiences was at Denver's Linger, which you of course mentioned later in the presentation saying, uh, oh my gosh, you guys, we ate the crickets and ants with delicious spicy sausage. That is awesome. <laughs> um, and then same thing, uh, lots, lots of shout outs for Linger. Um, and then Paula Kasky says that my son and I attended Bugs, Bites, and Brews at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science last September, and it was awesome. Rita ate a larva off a tree in the Amazon when their guide offered it and said it was like a spicy gumdrop. So clearly go. we have lots of brave eaters watching with us today and a couple That's of- That's fantastic. Folks. Yeah, so you, if you, you didn't have to convince everybody. Um, but it sounds like you might have convinced at least a few. Um, all right, a quick question. Um, Melissa wonders, what is your favorite insect to eat? Or do you personally have a favorite way of preparing insects for consumption? So I've eaten grasshoppers, crickets, um, mealworms, ants. Uh, I haven't eaten tarantulas. I, I hope to eat tarantulas someday. I've, I've heard they taste like, taste kind of nutty. I really like, um, I like mealworms. I think they, they have a nice flavor. Grasshoppers have kind of a, a subtle fishy flavor when you just pan roast them. They're quite good. You want to pull off the rear legs because they're spiny and, and probably pull off the wings because they're mostly chitin. They're inedible. Um, crickets have a funky flavor. So crickets I recommend, but I recommend them in savory dishes and not in sweet dishes. So crickets, I've had cricket cricket flour and I've used cricket flour for cookies and it's not so good. It's kind of a gamey flavor, but I think it would be quite good in breads. So I think cricket flour would be good in breads and crickets would be good on like maybe a spaghetti dish, uh, pan roasted in a little olive oil and a little bit of garlic. Everything's good with garlic. Um, so th those are some of my favorites. Very good. Yeah. You were saying beforehand that, uh, crickets were better in savory pastries. And now you've got me thinking, since we're all staying at home and the new craze is to start baking bread, uh, maybe we all need to start uh, baking some cricket bread. So if you do that, post a picture online and hashtag it with DMNS Science Party, because, oh my gosh, I would love to see that. Um, all right, let's see what else we've got. Question from Memory, wondering if one were to begin to add insects to their diet, 
what insects would you start with? And it sounds like maybe cricket flower would be a good recommendation or what do you yeah, think? Yeah, cricket, cricket flower is good. Um, I would start with the ones that are easy to get. So you can honestly, you know, at pet stores, you can, you can readily get mealworms or crickets. And if you're a little, you know, hesitant about what they've been fed, then just keep them and let them kind of, uh, don't feed them anything, keep them alive, let them poop out whatever's in their, in their digestive tract. And then you can flash freeze them and then you can serve them or cook them however you want. So I would get the ones that are easy to, to collect. If you wanted to, to try some wild caught insects, you could do that. You could go out and get some grasshoppers as long as it, you're, you're in legal areas where you're allowed to, to do that. What I would, what I would ha um, caution you about though, is you wanna make sure you're not collecting wild caught insects in any areas that are exposed to pesticides or chemicals too close to roads, that, that kind of thing, because you certainly could be ingesting some of those chemicals into you. Um, what else would I suggest? Those are, those are some of the things that I would suggest. And you know, one of the things I didn't mention that we should think about is if we are moving into a period where insects are being raised for human consumption, we do have to consider that we can impact insect populations if we over collect them. So, in Mexico, a lot of those um, chapulines are wild-caught grasshoppers. We don't really know how that's affecting those wild-caught populations. So I would say if we are going to consider this as an alternative food source and protein source, we should find ways to raise them like Wendy Lou McGill is at the Rocky Mountain Micro Ranch. That's an interesting perspective. Yeah, there are still, of course, you know, the ethical concerns may be a little bit different, but it sounds like we still need to make sure that we're being responsible and our consumption of insects is staying in balance with the natural world. That's really good exactly. advice. Yeah. That does actually get into a question. Uh, Rita, you might have answered it in this last uh, passage, but Rita wonders, since people use so many pesticides to get rid of insects, how does that affect the safety of eating them? So it sounds like maybe insects that have been treated with pesticides not safe. So if you are going to be collecting, you need to make sure you're doing it outdoors. Yes. And, and for your own health, if you're living in an urban environment, I would highly recommend that you consider reducing your exposure to pesticides, to these chemicals, to herbicides, because they are not good for, the, for human health. Interesting stuff. Yeah. A uh, quick one from Sarah, wondering how big was that queen termite? Can you maybe give it to us in inches or centimeters or show us on your fingers? Yeah, I think it's about, uh, I, I'm not positive, but I think a queen termite could get almost an inch or more in size. Very good. All right, that is all the questions that I see for the time being, and it is just about time for us to wrap up, but I do have one last question for you. Just in case there's anyone watching today who has not yet been swayed, and people, she already got me. Again, I said, as a biologist, I've seen a lot of the insides of creatures and I'm hesitant to eat a lot of them because I know what they look like, but this was such a good argument in favor of entomophagy that I might be willing to try it. If there's anyone out there who still is not convinced, what words do you have for them? So let me just put something in perspective. So I think most people would consider crustaceans, as I, as I started the lecture, you know, consider crustaceans perfectly reasonable, great thing to eat, lobsters, crabs, shrimp. But think about what lobsters and crabs are eating. They are bottom dwellers and they are feeding on the nastiest, ickiest stuff that is falling to the bottom of the sea. They are scavengers. And you are perfectly willing to eat those animals, but you're finding it a little queasy to eat a cricket or grasshopper that all it feeds on is plant material. That's a little odd to me. Mm. And I would say the next time you're having a bottle of tequila that has a tequila worm, instead of getting drunk on the tequila and, 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 uh, and, and seeing if you can then eat the tequila worm, flip it around, eat the tequila worm and chase it down with a little shot of tequila. There you go. Wise words from our curator of invertebrate zoology. And if nothing else, this presentation today was really an invitation to rethink some of your perspectives and to throw out some of your preconceived notions about what is good to eat, what is bad to eat, and what is gross. Uh, it's a big world out there, and it's always good to keep learning and exploring. And what better way than with delicious things that you can eat? All right, Absolutely. everybody. That's all the time that we have for today. So a big thank you to Dr. Paula Cushing for sharing your expertise and your appetite with us today. And a huge thank you to all of you for tuning in from home. Stay curious, stay safe, stay healthy. Uh, we will see you next time on the next edition of Science Division Live. Thanks for tuning in everybody. See you next time.